morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us again today on our second day of a three-day webinar series. I'm Rika Kierkegaard, Program Specialist on HIV AIDS at UNICEF headquarters in New York. And we are very, very pleased to be collaborating with the Pediatric Adolescent Treatment African Network um, to share the learnings from the regional summit in Johannesburg, South Africa, as part of UNICEF's learning collaborative on children HIV and H that really seeks to synthesize and share knowledge from the front line to inform improvements in policy making and programming. PATSA is an action network of health service providers and health facilities working on pediatric and adolescent HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. And we are right now broadcasting live from the summit, which is taking place on, uh, from yesterday, today, and again tomorrow. Their 2019 summit on integration of HIV and sexual reproductive health and rights for adolescents and young people was, as mentioned, kicked off yesterday. And the focus of today is on, is on leaving no one behind and reaching those that are more difficult to reach. So the focus on the presentations today will really be about reaching everyone and addressing our blind spots. We're very, very excited to be here to share a selection of some of the presentations, uh, findings, and practices that we've learned about at this second day of the summit. Our three speakers that will present highlights from day two are Niasha Sitole from the Athena Network in Zimbabwe, Angelica Pino from Sonke Gender Justice in South Africa, and finally we have Nashma Shaikh from Ket Impilo in South Africa. With me, I also have Luisa Orsa, who is the Gender Technical Lead at Frontline AIDS, who will be co-moderating this webinar today and share a few reflections from Frontline AIDS on the key outcomes of today. The presentations will take around 45 minutes, followed by 10 minutes for Q&A. And before we get started, I would like to just share a few words uh, about the webinar format. If you have any trouble hearing or if you have other technical issues, please send us a message and we will try to support. We send it via the chat box. Before writing us, you can also try to log in and out again, uh, restart your laptop and check your audio settings. Throughout the webinar, please do keep your minds on mute so we avoid any unnecessary background noise. And if at any time you have a question to one of the speakers, please do type it in and we will look at the questions and take them during the Q&A period in the end. Please note that for the Zoom webinar format, you can send questions either to all panelists, so all presenters, or the second option is to all panelists and attendees. That would be the preferred option for everyone to be able to see the question. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and the recording and all the materials will be made available online after the webinar on childrenandaids.org. Please do help share this recording after the webinar with any of your colleagues and were able to join us here today. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Niasha Sitole, again from the Athena Network in Zimbabwe. She's a highly dynamic young woman leader and she's an advocate on sexual reproductive health, HIV and AIDS and gender equality with a special interest in youth health and community development. The key areas of strength are community capacity building, mobilization, uh, training, and process facilitation for youth development and advocacy. And so our speaker, in contrast with most other of us, actually does not need slides. She will be speaking straight from the heart about her experience and the experience of other young pregnant mothers. Oh, sorry, adolescent mothers. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. So I'm going to be talking about um, the presence of adolescent girls and young women affected and infected by HIV in the HIV response. So when we talk about leaving no one behind, it is a very important and crucial issue that we must focus on because even the SDGs recognize this theme of leaving no one behind. And we do acknowledge and appreciate that the global community has made a lot of commitments to reach to the most vulnerable adolescent girls and young women. But however, to date, we still see high rates of HIV acquisition among adolescent girls and young women, which even translate into their access to treatment, care and support, and even issues of stigma and discrimination and quality 
access to healthcare services. So when we talk about who are the most left behind, for me, I always bring out the issues of young mothers as the ones or is one group that is usually most left behind. Because this is a group that has got different fears and concerns, unlike their peers who do not have children as yet. And some of the concerns even include their own physical health, talk about their own mental health and depression, talk about issues of disclosure and finding the right partner, disclosure to the families that they suddenly become part of where they're not they've not been part of, issues of our social economic issues of supporting their own children when they have them, the uncertainty around issues of giving birth and access to maternal and quality maternal health care. And all these issues, and most importantly, they are faced with the challenge of thinking about their vertical transmission for their babies when they are born or even during pregnancy. And this group needs special attention. <clears throat> To focus on. And another critical thing is when you look at the holistic development of young women, particularly adolescent girls and young mothers, we see that if we do not extend great support for them, they continue to be left behind and they continue to be trapped in a cycle of poverty. Because when we look at the issues around um, opportunities of development in the looking at education, mostly in most of our countries here in sub-Saharan Africa, especially Eastern and Southern Africa, I find that we don't have very strong uh, school re-entry policies for pregnant learners. Most cases, whenever a young person gets pregnant, they are told to go out of the school system and they cannot access the education any further, which is really a challenging opportunity because education provides that stepping stone towards economic empowerment, economic development and autonomy of young women. And also another challenge that you see the young mothers facing is around being a social misfit or outcast in the society and in the communities where they are coming from, especially if they are single mothers that do not have a partner who is around them to support them during the pregnancy or staying with them or being with them. This is really a huge challenge because each person has to live or strive or thrives when having relationships. But once you're treated as a social misfit and outcast in a community, that really becomes very challenging. And then when we look at representation and participation of young men versus young women, you find out that most cases, once a young woman has a baby, they are treated as an adult and they're automatically relegated out of the young person space or the youth space, which is very challenging. So that at the end of the day, you see that disproportionate um, uh, representation amongst the issues of young women versus the issues of young men, which is not really empowering because what we want to say is the young mothers, young women being involved in the space and having a voice for their own. And um, another challenge is also around strong support systems that we need when we are surviving in the community, at home and everywhere in every space that will be. And then when it comes to accessing healthcare services, antenatal care services, postnatal care services, we need to underline the issues of quality choice and also dealing with stigma within the health facilities, dealing with stigma within the community. Because when stigma faces us, it's like this big animal that is ready to devour and destroy us. And stigma asks us when we want to seek these health care services as a young pregnant mother to say, why are you pregnant? You are HIV positive. You're not supposed to be sexually active, which is really a challenge and hinders a lot when it comes to receiving this kind of services. So now when we look at the recommendations that I would want to propose is to say this year is 2019 and we're 11 years till 2030 towards the SDGs and we're only a few months up to 2020 where we have got these huge and ambitious targets on HIV prevention, treatment, care and support around the 1990 targets for 2020 and 1990 targets for 2030. And it is very key for us to realize that this is the crunch time where we need to action. And I would like to call to action on issues of Firstly, how do we improve engagement of young mothers in the spaces? We need to have clear and directed investments towards the participation of young mothers. They cannot be treated just like any other young woman, but this is a special group that needs attention and total investment, even when it comes to building their capacity to participate in spaces. 
We also need to push for political commitment towards all the strategies, the commitments that have been done by our leaders at global level, national level, even at our own community and government level. Because it's really sad and it's really puzzling for me every time when I get to hear about the word hard to reach areas, because whenever it's election time, there is not even an area that is called hard to reach. When our politicians are seeking power in office, when they need to be elected, they make sure that they can get to reach any space that they want to know that there are people who can vote for them. But it's very challenging to see that when now it comes to issues of accessing services, getting the services to the people, that's when the term hard to reach comes up. So for me, I believe there's nothing that is called hard to reach is either there's a deliberate effort to exclude some people or they are just not an important priority in that space which we need to change when we look at political commitment we also need to push on addressing structural barriers like harmful cultural plaques gender norms and practices that perpetuate the suppression and the incapacitation on the participation of young mothers in their spaces. Being a young mother does not mean you're no longer capable of delivering, being an advocate, being a young professional and participating in the spaces that you need to be. And we need to deal with these gender norms. Then we also need to improve access to comprehensive sexuality education. Because in most cases, when a young woman gets pregnant, they get chucked out of the school system, whether they are in university it is also hard for them to retain back to start their degree or their undergraduate or diploma. Even if they are in the lower grades in high school, it's also difficult for them to get back in the school system. And then when we look at the delivery of comprehensive sexuality education, it is more concentrated in delivering for youth in school. So what are we saying about access to comprehensive sexuality education for the young mothers and all the other youths that are out of school? So we need to expand on that. And we also need to push for a re revision of the school re-entry policies that we have so that they do not seek to destroy the opportunity and potential of young women and young mothers but instead seek to empower them. Then we also need to see an improved access to maternal health care. I'm sure most of our countries have signed the EWIC strategy, every woman, every child, and are part of the PMNCH conversations. And what it pushes for is for proper quality maternal health care, which I feel is very important for us to also focus on. Then we also need to look at how do we include the access to issues of mental health for the young mothers, because believe you me, this is not a very, very easy task for a young mother at a young age to be multitasking, to be dealing with stigma and discrimination, thinking about their own future and development, thinking about the child's future and development, and top of that, living with HIV. So there's need to also focus on providing services on mental health, psychosocial support, and involving their parents, guidance, and communities and people around them to offer the same services. Then we also need to look at how do we expand the broader sexual and reproductive health services that are received by young mothers. I have had an interaction of young mothers who don't want to go for cervical cancer screening because what we know is where we come from, the services for treatment, they are very, very limited. So it's really scary. So when we look at cervical cancer, we need to push for having the young mothers accessing the screening as well as the treatment in the event that cancer starts to develop within them. And this is very crucial if we're going to expand around um, contra around sexual and reproductive health services that they can get to. Then above all, we need also to focus on dealing with issues of stigma and discrimination. We need to have youth-friendly health services in our systems. The health services or youth friendliness should start from even having the security guard who is at the door, at the gate, and they should be able to make sure that the young person gets the attention that they want. We need to move away from some of the discriminatory languages that are found in our healthcare settings. For example, when you are getting registered in antenatal care, they start asking questions like, uh, where is your husband? We have told you that I have a husband. And now, even some visiting hours, you see, they say for the mothers we have delivered, then they say this is there's a specific visiting hour for the fathers. What if I'm a young mother who does not have the father around? How am I going to feel? That's a whole lot of stigma to deal with. So we need to start um, to see our health healthcare settings and our healthcare workers not being the perpetrators of stigma, but actually helping us to deal with the stigma and discrimination. So I feel that we have a long way to go when 
you look at the targets that we have, 2020 is around the corner, 2030 is not far away. And if you don't do justice and if you don't promote the rights of adolescent girls and young women who are young mothers, to make sure that in this spaces their voices are visible, to make sure that we lessen the burden of HIV that they are living with and make sure they develop holistically, we need to focus on them as a priority group. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Nyasha, for this powerful talk. We really appreciated hearing from your personal experience and your views on what needs to be done for young mothers, which was um, a theme that regardless of the sessions today really came up again and again and again. So it was very valuable, important for us to hear directly from you. Thank you. I'll now um, introduce our next speaker. So going from the issues related to young mothers, we'll now focus on where the boys and the men are. Um, it's very difficult to summarize uh, Angelica's, uh, Angelica Pino's journey in few sentences, but I will try. Um, she started her work in the human rights field in Chile in the 1980s. As a student and post-graduation, she worked as a lawyer in NGOs promoting the rights of disadvantaged communities, and she then became involved in the feminist and women's rights movements. She later joined the Ministry of Justice and then moved to South Africa in 1994, uh, where she joined the NISA Institute for Women's Development and then again continued in the feminist movement there. Angelica joined Sonke Gender Institute in June 2010 in the position as resource mobilization manager. And in 2014, she took the position of Sonke's director of programs. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over the floor to mm. you, Angelica. Thank you so much. And thanks for the invitation to join the webinar. And I'm going to talk about you know, the group that we usually don't associate with being discriminated or left behind. We always assume men are on top of everything. But I think there is an issue about men being involved or not in the HR spaces. It has always been our kind of responsibility, sometimes a burden. Women have to do everything in that space. So the question is, where are the men, basically? So that's what I want to talk to you about today. Where are the blind spots in the struggle against HIV and AIDS? And in this presentation, I want to, to touch on a few, sort of two key, key blind spots. One is, where are the men? So, because it takes to do tango, where are the men in the SRHR space? And then also the intersection between GBV and a SRHR and HIV. I think we have a, for, for people who come from the more the gender sector, the GBV sector, we have seen that sometimes there is connect with the HIV struggle. So, how we can connect those two struggles? And then I will touch on some promising ideas or programs. So, first of all, an issue about the, the demographics and the data are kind of, there is a disconnect here. We have, in the Eastern and Southern Africa region, 23.8% of, uh, of people who are adolescent boys and young men, aged 10 to 34, that's 117 million people. So this is like a quarter of our population here. But when you ask where are they in the search space, it's very little presence, very little information too. So right now we are doing a research for UNFPA on what are the services, the needs and services available for young men, adolescent and a, a boys and young men. And what we have found is this very little actually. So where do you find these men sometimes? You find them sometimes in the contraception space, family planning, prenatal care, safe delivery and postnatal care. There's a bit of increase in that actually. There's, you can see many getting involved sometimes in the, in the delivery of, of, of their children. Then you also have the <coughs> sorry, reproductive tract, tract infection, STIs. Comprehensive sexuality education, again, there is a bit more of that. Male cancer is less. Prevention and treatment of staff fertility and infertility. Sexual function and dysfunction, not so much. What we see is more around the HIV response, but not even there. I, I will prove it's, it's enough. Then very little presence in supporting self-abortion and abortion care and harmful traditional practices, FGM or forced child, for child marriage. So the, the men are not in this space. Where we, where we think that they have been engaged, we have made some efforts in the HIV response. But what I want to say is that not even good enough. So we have, again, the differences of, of what, how the epidemic is affecting uh, men and women in the region. New infections, we know more women. 
people living with HIV, more women. People living with HIV and on AIT, women. But when you see the data about who is dying more of AIDS-related uh, AIDS -related deaths are men. So the point of, of the, the argument is, what is going on here? Something is going really wrong. And we, to get to zero, we need to get to men. So again, more data here about uh, so more female getting infected, but more male dying. Die. So this is a lot of, of slides. I'm not going to go into the detail, but just to show how men are more affected in terms of death. Um, again, more women also uh, being tested than men. And this is all regional data. Then who also women getting more retrovirals. But then we have again more, more men lost to treatment basically. So that's that's kind of some of the key information here. And <laughs> the same happens. That those, the data show before was very much in general, women and men, gender segregated data. But when you go to young people, exactly the same. You see an increase among the adolescent boys and young men of, of, of death, basically. So the point is gender matters in the HIV response. Men are less likely to get tested than women. There's a low male testing and treatment rates, which increase the HIV transmission to female partners, by the way. So it's for the sake of men and for the sake of women, we need to get to men, basically. That's the key message. Men, men are not accessing antiretroviral treatment as much as women. Men have a lower CD4 count when they start treatment. They are likely to interrupt treatment. So all this means that men are less likely to achieve by, by a low suppression. So all the preventative efforts really kind of are not realized. And we know also young men of biology, but young people are not getting the right knowledge. They have very low knowledge and significant risk behavior for the same reason. Another blind spot, and I don't want, I just did, I'm just posing the, the problem here, but I will come to some sort of proposal, solution. Another blind spot is the intersection between DBV and HIV. So we know they have documented the links between DBV and HIV by now. Common risk factor for DBV and HIV, gender inequalities at the center. What are the examples, for instance? Women exposed to violence in childhood or who make early sexual debut, often coerced, by the way are a high risk of intimate partner violence and HIV. Men who have experienced or witnessed child violence in childhood end up with harmful use of alcohol, concurrent partnerships, and perpetration of violence against women, and of course, increased risk of HIV. And of course, condoning violence and social or gender norms and cultural practices, legitimizing male control over women, leads again to women accessing less information, health information. Another link <laughs> is, <laughs> Sorry, violence against women as an indirect factor for increased HIV and a barrier to uptake of HIV services. We know that women in abusive relationships are less likely to negotiate condom use and practice safe sex. Women victims of violence are stigmatized, which means also they have less kind of they, less likely to seek HIV services. And then also, of course, on the evident one, sexual violence is a direct risk factor for HIV, whether it's a stranger rate or repeated rape in intimate partner relationships. And again, violence against women is an outcome of HIV status, forced sterilization or intimate partner violence. So those are kind of the, thank you. So all those are kind of the, the connection between HIV and, and GBV. And if you think that we are not exposed to that in the region, think twice. And this slide here shows you that about a third of women reported physical violence or controlling behavior of partners in our region. So this is kind of quite, quite a scary data. Uh, and and the, the, so the proportion of women is 15 plus getting HIV because they're exposed to violence is very high. So what can we do about this? First of all, how we tackle the blind spot on engaging men and boys? One key thing is, it's not an easy thing. It's not a simple thing. And I think people have tend to think that Oh, let's just talk about changing social norms and, and men's kind of a, a, a masculinity. A, we talk about some toxic masculinity. We change that and we think this will be sorted. We don't think it's the case. Focusing only on gender norms is an oversimplification for us. Because we also have an issue with men accessing a, a, point, a entry point to the health system the same way women have it. We have been used to kind of, because again, we were there, we had the Sometimes we get really burden of all these sanitary issues, so we are used to. We go to the hospital, we go to all the facilities. Men are not used to that somehow. So there are also a, 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 a structural issues with men accessing this. 
Uh, also, we have um, health systems agencies that go beyond the service delivery. So this is not an enabled environment. And when we hear sometimes about men saying, when I go to the clinic, I'm not welcome, sort of, because people don't think I should be here asking for contraception or, or information, or I shouldn't be in the delivery room of, of my child, for instance. So we have kind of also a system from the system. And also, the issue of men are missing from public health strategies in general, in the study chart, and also in HIV. It's better now, but I think we still, in the big picture, men are not present there. So what can we do? And UNAIDS, Promundo, and Sonke Gender Justice, and Men Engage Africa, we have been for quite a while promoting, a, like advocating for a plan, how to fast track the involvement of men in the HIV response. And this comes also builds on the UNAIDS Global Platform for Action on Men and HIV. And this is a very cumbersome, it's kind of very, very big slide and very ambitious though. And we talk about there are different levels. So here we show a structural, how we can stay from a structural point of view, enable men accessing the services. Prevention, how we can increase the, the, the prevention of HIV among men and boys. Testing, how to test more men, how to make it easy for men. And how to, once if you are positive, how do you go for treatment and adhere to treatment. So in this slide, I think the key components, and I will, again, I'm not going to read all this, but there are different levels, you can see the slide there. And again, I wanted to go to the point about the transformed gender norms is just one aspect of this. We have been putting a lot of emphasis on that, and it is important. We need to continue with that. But there are a lot of other things we need to be fixing. Better messaging about, you know, how to engage men and boys in their HR services. It, how to make it easier to go to the, to, the, to the facilities. Do we need extended hours? Do you need male, male corners? Do you need community distribution of information? How do you reach those men who are not going to go to the facility like women? So at some point, I've had some experiences, you know, on programming, going to the Shivins, for instance, where we provide information on DVB, on HIV, you know. So go to where the men are, basically. And make it a bit easier, because otherwise they're not going to turn the tide. So this is kind of like a... This platform, hopefully, we are expecting to, will be launched in the coming ICDP in Nairobi. But the point is, again, with the plans, unless the countries adopt them, and us at community level believe in this, it's not going to happen. So that's a key thing. The plan is as, as good as it is on paper, but we need to do something about it. Now, what can we do about the intersection between GDV and HIV? There are a lot of programs here. And I think I will, I will uh, uh, I invite you to, uh, to actually visit the WHO, it is in the next page, uh, a site where there are very interesting uh, ideas about how to address the intersection. First of all, there are what we call uh, multisexual approaches. For instance, economic empowerment of women. We know it's very important, cash transfers, uh, tackling property and inheritance loss, but that's one aspect. The, then the, the second one, <coughs> which has been where we have been working for a long time, transforming cultural and social norms related to gender. And here we have community education and mobilization norms or norms change, communication campaigns. And here is where we have put a lot of also emphasis on engagement and both on this gender transformative approach, saying you don't need to be the man in the old fashion. You don't need to be always a strong, violent, you know. There can be different ways to be a man. And that means decreasing violence and also in HIV risk. We have Stepping Stones, of course, quite well known now, SASA, Sonke, my organization, Sonke One Man Can Campaign. We also have a project called SEMA, which was an intervention at community level and in very rural areas on how you mobilize the community to engage also men and boys in the response. Another way to do this too is integrating violence against women and HIV services. So, and I will talk a bit more on that. And the last one, of course, is the usual one, promote and implement laws and policies that tackle the issue of gender equality or inequality and HIV and violence against women. And because we are here with people who work in the front line of service provision, I wanted to just speak a bit more about violence against women and HIV services integration. What we can do, for instance, is <coughs> addressing potential violence and in HIV reduction counseling. When you have, a, think of a sex worker, for instance, you know, is the it's a space to talk about potential violence that woman or a man is, is actually a, a, a challenge to, for confronting too. Then uh, addressing violence in HIV testing and counseling, PMCT, we know that that's also a very common one, and in treatment and care services. So how can we train our health professionals to identify signs of violence, 
counsel, obviously, with the right skill. Not everyone can do counseling, but can we provide this training to our service, health service providers to be able to identify and very sensitive, in a sensitive way, address the issues with the, with the people who go as patients. Um, then, of course, providing comprehensive post rape care, including a, a, a PrEP. And, of course, the last one is the addressing HIV in service for survivors of violence. One example we have in South Africa is the Tutu Selaker Centers. It's kind of a one stop for victims of sexual violence, where you have a legal assistance, you have psychological support, and, of course, also a PrEP and, and a, a all this kind of health package, let's say, for a victim of violence. So these are several ways to really, where we, 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 we don't see the HIV and violence against women or GBV issues separately. So we need more integration of services. And again, to have more ideas about how to tackle the intersection, you can go to this document, Program and Tool of the WHO, called 16 Ideas for Addressing Violence Against Women in the Context of the HIV Epidemic. And I think that's it from my side. And I just wanted to say again, just mentioning the last slide of my presentation is we had a, so we had a campaign years ago. We were promoting a voluntary medical medicine concession, but we also wanted to work on gender norms. So we did a whole kind of campaign, you know, of engaging the partners too and fun, in a fun way with posters. We had PSAs, we had a taxis with a wrap around, with messages around, you know, now you're a man, sort of what does that mean? You are circumcised, but what does that mean? It, how, are you going to change your behavior towards women or are you going to become naturally much more kind of aware of, of you know, the gender equalities or inequalities? So basically try to uh, integrate gender, uh, social, uh, gender and social norms change in a very kind of very basic practice, which is the circumcision. It's not just the cat, it's more than the cat. So that was one of the examples of programming in this space. Thank you so much, Angelica, um, for reminding us not to forget boys and men, because as you said, it takes two to tangle, um, and for giving us suggestions on how to involve and address issues related to men, because if we only integrate HIV and SRHR services, and we don't think about integration in a broader perspective, we may lose out on the opportunity to involve them more. Thank you once again. I'll then um, hand over to our last speaker for the day, Nashma Shaikh from Kevin Pilo in South Africa. Uh, Dr. Nashma Shaikh is trained as a public health specialist and epidemiologist. She's currently working as a consultant epidemiologist for Kevin Pilo and other institutions. And during the course of her career, Dr. Shaikh has worked as an academic, as a researcher, and as a health manager. Her main research area center on the epidemiology of HIV and STIs, on HIV surveillance, and m and &E of programs in the public health sector. Thank yes. you very much. Um, I think I've got the last session, and um, I'm going to make it as practical as possible, and as practical as it is to implement in a, at a very local setting. So just to set the scene, why deliver integrated services? And it's founded actually in, you know, the founding documents were the Millennium, Millennium Development Goals, then the SDGs, where it was explicitly stated that um, we need to integrate services, explicitly stated that young people are being left behind and SRH and R services need to be made more accessible. So in that context, I want to paint a picture for you in terms of how at a local level one can respond to a global, a national and a provincial call for action. So let's begin with, let's look at the problem. What is the problem? So as you may know that Sub-Saharan Africa carries a very large burden of the HIV epidemic amongst adolescent and, adolescent and children living with HIV AIDS. And the, the, the diagram on your right shows the heterogeneity of the epidemic in terms of how different the HIV prevalence is by country across the continent. But what you will see though, is that there is a large concentration around the southern or eastern southern Africa region. And this is where the large proportion of the burden of HIV sits. 
So in contrast to that, if we look at the unmet contraceptive needs of young women and girls, which is painted out in various documents that a lot of young women and girls are unable to um, have their contraceptive needs met, we see that there is also a variation um, across the various countries. And more specifically, in terms of with no contraception offered, we find that the upshot may be unplanned pregnancies, and particularly unplanned teenage pregnancies. And in this context, we have data that shows that 42% of women living in urban areas in sub-Saharan Africa, um, aged between 15 and 24, had pregnancy before the age of 18. And in rural areas, it's actually 50%, which is extraordinarily high. So we ask ourselves, what is the picture in South Africa? And South Africa is known for many things, but particularly for having the largest epidemic in the world, the largest number of people with, on ARV in the world, and also called the epicenter of the epidemic. And unfortunately, adolescents and youth carry a disproportionate burden of, of this epidemic. So to put it into context in terms of actual numbers, we have about 1,200 young women and girls being infected per week in South Africa. And that is quite jarring. And in terms of this high rate or this high incidence, the South African government, together with all its partners, have formulated incredible policies that are very progressive and call out for making services accessible. So while it's true to say these policies exist, implementation at a lower level has been a little harder. And particularly in areas where there's high levels of multiple deprivation. So I'm going to describe to you, if you're gonna drill down to this picture over here, if you can see this map, to a sub-district that sits in the eye of the epicenter of the epidemic called Dwedwe in Elembe. And I'm going to paint you a picture of how an integrated program was implemented. So just to give you a background of Dreadway, it has a population that's largely youthful, simply because many parents have migrated out of the district to go and work in the urban areas, and or many parents have died. Um, in terms of youth, having a youth bulge, we also have a matching a large proportion of youth unemployed. And as a result of this, there's high levels of, of unemployment, uh, incomplete education, high levels of poverty, high levels of teenage pregnancy, all match with high levels of HIV. So what did we plan to do? So initially, our, the program was um, originated as a result of a local level request. So Kathleen Pilo has been providing health system strengthening for HIV treatment care and support on behalf of the South African government in areas that had high levels of multiple deprivation and where the state couldn't uh, uh, you know, supply these services rapidly. And as we were implementing these health system services, we started to participate at a local level with the multi-sexual partners at a ward level to discuss what are the key development issues that need to be addressed cross-sectionally, um, intersectionally. And what came out from our partners is, it's all well you're treating people in your facilities, but our bigger problem is, we have very, very high levels of teenage pregnancy, unplanned, and very, very high levels of um, HIV AIDS amongst our youth. And could you possibly assist us with that? So we didn't really have a framework except for the integrated school health plan, which was um, finalized in 2013, but there were no implementation plans and guidelines to say how exactly you're going to have to do it at the local level. And so with, by bringing together a range of partners across all sectors, we sat down with our potential recipients in the district and started to chart something. And our first take was we will try to respond to the first call, which, just, which was to prevent new HIV infections, STIs, unintended pregnancies, 
through education, testing, counseling, and referral, improve the uptake of health and welfare services by offering screening and referrals to um, health and welfare services, strengthen community partnership, strengthen intersectional collaboration so that these referral pathways are fluid and easy to follow, and finally, and most importantly in most programming, to continually improve what you're doing and to sustain it. Because as an NPO, you can't be implementing forever. At some point, we have to put in our sustainability measures in place so that the state can take over or local communities are able to deliver this type of services within the context. So here is a conceptual model of the program. And as you can see, the schools in the communities are at the heart of the issue in terms of the program. And leveraging through the schools, uh, we would sort of reach out to the youth-friendly services, which includes health and a range of sexual partners, such as social protection, such as a, a home affairs and South African police. And then on the other side, we have a whole range of CBOs and, and organizations representing various uh, you know, sectors who also deliver at the same time within this context. So leveraging off the schools, we would also include youth within the, the environment and the space and households. And the reason why we've charted these arrows quite fluid is to create some kind of fluidity in terms of the referral mechanism. And that comes from the ward-based approach of sitting down regularly and saying, where are our gaps and how do we improve these referral pathways? So just to sort of come back to say to you who actually delivered these programs, the program was delivered by a multidisciplinary team consisting of nurses, and all of them were from the community, um, many of them relatively younger, so that they could reach out to the adolescents and youth in a manner that's fairly more, of fairly more acceptable and, and, and accessible. And we had social workers, social auxiliary workers, community health care workers, who all contributed to providing the service. So we had a very, very um, mixed uh, group of skills where this kind of services were presented. So I'm not going to go into the detail of measurement, but just to say that we did a baseline survey and then a follow-up um, you know, survey post-intervention at year one and then continued to follow up. And throughout the course of the program from 2015, we followed up uh, the learners for the schools and we had programmatic data. So before I sort of you know, paint the picture of um, who will we sort of providing these services, I thought I'd share with you a picture. Because they say a picture paints a thousand words. Because often, you know, numbers just get followed into more numbers and then it feels very depersonalized. So here is a picture from Dwe Dwe in the middle of a school day. And here we see a few primary school learners walking right down the hill to the local river where the water is not safe, but having to carry all this water up the hill back to the school so that there is adequate water for hand washing and for the pit latrines. And this is, this is the picture of where we are trying to implement a program that is intersectional, that not only addresses SRHNR, but also has to take into consideration the other components that need um, care, that need support and needs to be addressed. So just to say to you, the households were largely, of the learners that we um, assist, were largely headed by women and mainly grandmothers. Um, you know, many of the households were dependent on social protection in the form of grants because there were high levels of poverty at the house le household level, high levels of food insecurity at 33%. Many of the children walked long distances to school, uh, commuted for long, came to school very tired, often afraid while commuting to school, and very often hungry when they arrived at school. And sort of to focus on the sexual behavior component at the baseline survey, at the first goal, 
we, we, we heard from our learners through the anonymous surveys that a large proportion of learners, especially um, you know, women saying the first time I had sex, it was something, what, you know, was it something I wanted? You know, and not many women said that. So we do see sexual coercion amongst men, amongst females and males in this context, as well as with rape, as well as in terms of, of gender-based violence, which I will be able to share with you at some other point. Um, so in terms of the pregnancy rates, the reported pregnancy rates, we see 17% reported by the young women, and then 95 which again validates that the large proportion of the young women's um, you know, partners were older men. So looking at knowledge, attitudes, and behavior. And we started this epidemic looking at knowledge, attitudes, and behavior. And we've had two or three decades of campaigning, providing you know, adequate knowledge on HIV transmission and so on. And we still find ourselves in a situation where you know, young people are not very really clear about the knowledge, on basic knowledge around acquisition, how to protect yourself, in terms of HIV transmission and so on. What we see over here, you know, one of the basic tenets of, of prevention is condoms or barrier protection can prevent HIV AIDS. And we found that, you know, just under a third of the learners were actually understanding that that was, you know, an option. So, you know, while we saw a change over time, significant change, we're still not there. We're not out of the woods and we need to get it right up to 90%. So this was in year one and we've seen some improvement. And then again, we also saw a large proportion of stigma that still exists, that HIV is a death sentence. And then there are myths also that exist in terms of having sex with a virgin will protect a person from contracting HIV AIDS. So very worrying, and we, we immediately realized that we're going to have to start addressing some of these, these um, the feedback that learners gave us through the anonymous surveys. And then we've explored, you know, in terms of are you willing to have an HIV test? And we see the gender differentials where more young women were, you know, keen to be able to have uh, an HIV test than, than males at baseline. But over time, post-intervention, they almost equalized, highlighting that with appropriate intervention for boys, and we heard from our previous speaker who really advocated that we need to put measures in place to get the boys to the services or get our services to the boys and, and young men. And this is indicative of how things can shift if we actually make the effort to do that. So moving on to, you know, when we talk about what makes a service um, youth friendly, because there's a lot of talk about that, but we can, we, we can focus on that. So one of the measures for, for any kind of programming is to see what is the uptake of the, of the service by the recipients of the service? To what level have we created demand and uptake so that you know, you know you're going along the path of reaching people who you want to reach. And as you can see with the graph on the top one, looking at program reach. So in the first year, we targeted one school and you can see a very slow, monotonic, you know, sort of chugging along increase. And then suddenly there's an upswing reaching saturation by the end of year one. And this highlights that, um, you know, Demand creation is one thing from our perspective as, as health service providers, but it's all about building trust. It's about communication. It's about creating safe spaces before there is an uptake of services. And that doesn't happen overnight. You know, it takes a while to build up relationships and trust. So as you see along the way, as we scale up to more and more schools, we saw the dip at the beginning of the scale up and a saturation at the end of, you know, a scale up following the next one. So in terms of, you know, learner pregnancy, and we heard about it from the previous speaker, where it's highlighted that often learners are, you know, sort of encouraged to leave school as soon as the pregnancy is, um, is diagnosed or, or detected by an educator. 
And that was one of our goals, was to look at teenage pregnancy rate. And what we did see, though, which was quite promising and encouraging, is with the combination of our, our package of services, we had a massive reduction in teenage pregnancy in year one. And even though we may have scaled up, we continued to maintain levels below 5% in the long term. And, you know, focusing on what makes a service youth-friendly and why are so youth-friendly services important. And I'm sure you're aware from the literature that we do know that the younger you are, you know, if you're a female, you have an older partner, your negotiation skills are compromised in negotiating that your partner uses a condom with you or barrier protection with you. But what we found quite... Um, quite interesting and actually quite promising is if a learner reported at a clinic was perceived as youth friendly, they were more likely to use a condom at the last sexual uh, intercourse, which highlights that we really need to focus on youth friendly services. And focusing on youth friendly services, we talk about asking the learner, did you feel welcome? Did you feel respected? You know, do you know where to find help? And those are all the elements we saw that there was an improvement. So, you know, it's often said, you know, there's data, there's statistics and so on. But I think it's quite important to understand, you know, the experience of the recipient in their own voice. And these are some of the comments that came out from our interviews. And we learned that, you know, the learners expressed that adults made them afraid. And maybe, you know, our messaging, it may not be, you know, verbal messaging, but nonverbal communication may come through where we, the way we deliver, you know, our messaging, they, they do feel afraid. And, you know, the fact that after the education, they would say, I don't think it's a death sentence, I now have hope. Um, those are the kind of feedback one needs so that one can reinforce our education and our programs so that we can address fears, stigma, and myths around HIV AIDS. And then the last component we did was in order to not only reach a learner, but also reach the household of learners, because many of these households were very fragile in terms of, of you know, socioeconomic um, you know, status. We then decided to hold large welfare jamborees within the village, you know, attracting 3,000 people, attracting the whole age range from zero to, you know, over just under one to 97 years of age. And what you see here is a classic picture of a grandmother called a gogo who brought the baby that's in her care, you know, for a checkup as well as for herself. And so in that scenario, you would find that she could get her eyes tested her blood pressure screening done, and also uh, ensure that the baby's immunization status is checked and appropriate care and services is offered. And we also make it a fun event where the learners, from all the stuff they've learned through our program, they express it in the form of dance, debates, songs, and the parents and the caregivers and the entire village, traditional healers, all partners come together and it's, it's a day of celebration and service uptake. So what are our take-home messages? Our take-home messages is, even in resource-constrained settings, they are the spaces to work collectively, to work intersectorally, to, to deliver programs that can reach those that are considered hard to reach. Um, that sexual experience often occurs in the context of sexual coercion for both males and females that youth-friendly services are important. Uh, they're not only important to attract young people to the service, but also important to shape their behavior in terms of their own wellness. Leveraging of existing platforms such as schools, churches, fishes, all are important spaces that allow us to reach those that do not come to the facilities. And you know, one of the take-home message is work with your national policy and your framework but the onus is on us to co-create at a local level and co-deliver at a local level so that we can reach, you know, people who don't come to the facilities. And finally, you know, always saying, engage with recipients in what they would like, how they would like it, and where they would like the service. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Nashma, for giving this um, very good model, presenting this very good model for integration across sectors and for really having a holistic approach to young people. Um, it's, I was thinking that uh, while gender is really at the heart of HIV, or through these three presentations, I think it really becomes clear that gender considerations are really um, at the foundation of reaching everyone and of really of uh, not leaving anyone behind. And so I think it's also an excellent opportunity to have um, Rizorsa with us as a, the gender technical lead at Frontline AIDS. Um, if you want to share some of your perspectives, thoughts, Thank you, um, thank you, Rika, and um, and all the presenters. The, the 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 presentations were absolutely fascinating and so rich. Um, and I'm also aware that we've you know had a number of questions and comments on the on the chat. So I'm going to keep my reflections to an absolute minimum because I think our presenters our presenters really really and our presentations really speak for themselves. But just to sort of recap, I think you know we're here at the Pata Summit. Um, looking at um, SRHR and HIV integration. Um, the theme for today in particular has been ready to reach and serve all in the context of integrated SRHR and HIV services for young people in their diversity. And in particular, we've been looking at that, that second R in SRHR, i.e. the rights part of SRHR and how that often is neglected um, and how we really, really need to focus on that if we're going to remove some of the barriers that stand between young people and uh, receiving the, the healthcare um, and other services that they have a right to. And part of that, is, as you've all made amply clear, is about um, addressing gender inequality and harmful gender and other social norms. I think um, just, just to give a one minute reflection, I think I'm really pleased that at this summit we've had quite a lot of focus on adolescent and young mothers living with HIV, which Niasha has spoken about so passionately and articulately in um, this discussion. Um, and, I, and I really feel that that is a, a, a group where we see the nexus of many intersecting issues coming together around um, gender-based violence, around um, adolescents and young women's choice, um, and around adolescent girls and young women's um, rights. Um, we see this group as a group that has some very specific needs that are often not taken care of in either the adolescent and youth um, response, nor in the um, women living with HIV response. Um, and, and it's a group that can easily find itself isolated, you know, from, but, you know, without really a peer group. It is its own peer group, but sort of falling out of those other peer groups. And so I think that focus has been really, really important for crystallizing some of the um, issues that our other speakers also made reference to. Um, I, I've made so many notes that I can hardly read them, <laughs> um, but and I and I and I don't want to take up too much time. But I think you know some of the words that have really come up for me in this discussion are safe spaces. I, I can hear myself talking. <laughs> Sorry, little echo in the room. Um, youth youth friendly services and the role of service providers. but I'm going to carry on regardless of the echo, um, but also the role of other actors. Um, and I think that um, um, Najama's um, presentation just spoke to that very clearly about the, um, you know, the need for an inter intersectoral and multidisciplinary response. And, and then of course that the piece around bringing in men and boys, both as, um, as, as individuals with their own needs and rights to access services, um, but also as both perpetrators and survivors of, of, of violence, as well as advocates and agents for change. So um, 
I, yeah, I, I, as I say, I could go on, and, and, and I think you know the, the 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 last point that I really want to to reflect on very quickly is just this 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 the point that again all our speakers made about being responsive to the needs of the individuals that you're serving and bringing in the kind of tools and models that fit best in that situation and at the heart of that obviously is the you know is the lived reality and the meaningful involvement of the people that we want to serve be it adolescent girls and young women living with hiv men and boys or the whole the whole range of, um, of of young people that we want to serve. So let me let me pass over back to, to Rika to um, to see uh, what questions that we have coming from uh, all of you listening, and very quickly respond to some of those as I know time is extremely short. Yes, thank you so much for your insights. Um, they were extremely interesting. Thank you for sharing. And as you mentioned, unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, so, of course, if anyone needs to drop off, please drop off. But for those that have a few more minutes, I will just take um, the questions that there are. If anyone has any burning questions, please do feel, uh, feel free to send them in now, even if it's past the end time of the webinar. Um, there are a lot of really interesting comments that I highly encourage all of you to read. Uh, but there's one question that came through uh, to our last speaker that I just wanted to read out loud. If you can share insights on how you managed to break through the school system where health education or engagements are limited by the criteria stipulated within the life orientation program. Okay. So um, when we started the program, there wasn't a very structured life orientation program for SRHNR. There are guidelines as to what should be covered, but there were no um, content material that the teachers were using. And the way in which we, 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 we developed this was in relation to engaging with the school governing body and the school and the parents in terms of the content, but guided by the National School um, Integrated School Health Policy as to what can be covered at the particular age and grade. So mindful of you know, the requirements of and the guidelines of the national framework, but the content was developed then you know, in the context of that space. And we modified uh, the content of it as we went along because we brought in more gender-based violence issues, and we also brought in more content as the learners wanted to, uh, to, to learn more. What we also learned then is that the educators felt that they also wanted to learn about the content. And when we did a pre-intervention um, pre survey just with the educators within the schools that we were working, we realized that they also, you know, were were in need to have some kind of additional information around you know SRHNR to be able to deliver it. And so we ran parallel you know program, educational program for the educators too, so that there was synergy. But yes, it is difficult getting through um, you know, into schools. Our parents would say you're going to teach our kids about sex, you're going to make them promiscuous, they may be too young. But you know, our approach was very, very careful community entry. And you know, when communities are facing these challenges on a daily basis, there is that openness, you know, coming from the community saying, come through, you know, help us do and fix this, you know, and let's do it together. And I think that for us was the entry point. We didn't have gatekeepers at the school. The school the educators worked with us. The parents worked with us and all the sexual partners worked together. Thank you. I think we don't have any more questions that come through, just um, a few very good insightful comments. So I will close it for now unless someone has any burning question. And if not, if you come up with something um, after this webinar, please do send them to me and we will get back to you. We'll also post a PowerPoint and a recording of the webinar on childrenandaids.org. 
And then finally, if you were interested in the presentations today and you would like to learn more about integrated services for adolescents and young people, please do tune in again tomorrow. It will be two hours earlier, so at 7.30 New York time, 1.30 Johannesburg time, 2.30 Nairobi, um, using the same link where we'll have presentations and findings from the third and the final day of the PATSA Summit. And tomorrow we'll focus on clinic community collaboration in the context of HIV and SRHR integration. So thank you once again to our three excellent speakers and our uh, co-moderator that shared some really um, interesting insights. Thank you to all of uh, you out there and I hope to see you again tomorrow.